fishermen and making them disciples. Are you ready, Church of Christ? We were born for this, to give God glory because he's worthy. Psalm 72, verse number 18 through 20. Go ahead and drop up a message in the chat line and let's give God some love because his love is lustrous. We know his rule is righteous. His grace is glorious. His mercy is matchless. His blessings are bounteous. And his care for us is constant. So let's give God Amen. mercy, love, deposit of thanksgiving. So drop a message in the chat line. Let us know where you're from. And let us thank God for all his benefits. And let's thank God for all his servants. From Sunday night all the way uh, to Wednesday night, God's real life. Because remember what David said, brethren and brethren. David said, I was glad. Not sad and not mad. He said, I was glad when it was time to come together in the name of the Lord. And so that's the purpose of this event, brethren and brethren. Uh, to put God on display, even in the most adverse circumstances, to those who don't know him as God, especially. And so it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you this evening to the amazing annual Caribbean Lectureship Virtual Event 2022, night number three. It is something very special indeed. We thank God for the preaching of the word Sunday night. We thank God for the proclamation of the word last night. And we thank God ahead of time, uh, if it's God's will, for the heralding of his word tonight and tomorrow night. But tonight, brethren and friends, uh, we have Brother Adrian Ed to speak on Isaiah chapter 49, verse number 15, engraved on God's path. Mm. And then we also have Brother Elton Terry uh, to speak on Isaiah 49, verse 19 through 21, who has borne me these. Mm. Uh, so biblical preaching is what is expected, and that's what you're going to get, because biblical preaching is proclamation done for God's glory and man's growth. And so these brothers preach the word of God for no other reason but for God's glory and for man's growth. And so we give God thanks for that. We want to let you know also, brethren and friends, that this is a live streaming event. You can go ahead and share the Zoom link to your family and your friends. Share the Zoom link to your neighbors and your subscribers because this event can be viewed on the ACL website, it is live streamed on, on the ACL Facebook page and YouTube page at West End Church of Christ, Bermuda. We also have our brother Kareem Feds and also brother Sean Williams to lead us in songs before the governor of the universe. So let us prepare our hearts, prepare our hubs, and prepare our humanity for the engrafted work which is able to save our souls. Uh, we call on the experienced and beloved Brother Mahes Bisunda, a minister of the San Juan Church of Christ, Trinidad and Tobago, to open up in prayer and send up our petitions on the wings of faith to none other than the God of heaven. We invite Brother Mahes Bisunda to open us in a word of prayer. Brother Mahes. Good evening, everyone. Let us go to God in a word of prayer this time. Our loving and kind Father who art in heaven, the creator and sustainer of this magnificent universe in which we live, the God in whom we live and move and have our being, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, we come to you at this time with praise and thanksgiving. 
recognizing, Father, the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, O oh God, for coming our way when we needed you the most and when we were helpless and could not do anything to bring ourselves out from under the rule of the tyrannical one. But Father, you gave up your only son. You made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we, Heavenly Father, could receive your righteousness. We ask, O oh God, let us be all our assembled tonight in our homes or wherever we are, we give thanks for allowing us this opportunity, Father. We know that we have not been able to meet physically due to the pandemic, but Lord, you have provided a means whereby we can still have contact, we can still see each other, speak to each other, and we can still be encouraged by the preaching of your word. We thank you for this great lectureship, Father, and for the opportunity that you have provided so that it can be hosted, Lord, and with the view in mind, Father, to declare the wonderful gospel, to shed light, Father, to the nations all over the world. We ask, O oh Heavenly Father, that tonight will be no other than the nights that have gone before. We have been edified and encouraged and uplifted, and we pray for the speakers this evening, that they too, Father, will continue to expound from your holy and divine word, your wonderful and searchable riches, that we will be able to be uplifted, Father, we would be edified, and that if there be any tonight who are with us, who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they will contemplate, Lord, inviting the Lord Jesus into their lives. We ask, Lord, that your word will sound forth with power, and that your servants will speak with love and humility, and that you will empower them through your Holy Spirit, that they will declare your counsel fully tonight. Thank you, Father. We pray for the sound leaders, and for all those who will play a part tonight in this great session that we will have, that your name will be glorified, that we will be edified, and that, Father, we will be better servants in your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you will be mindful of those who are sick among us, that you will touch them with your healing hands. And whatever needs others may have, Lord, we know that you know better than even we do. We ask that you will touch us where we need to be touched, Help us to realize that we serve a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Therefore, God, help us to take all of our petitions before you and give us the strength to stand in the gap that we might, Father, be able to declare and to bring light to a world of darkness. We'll be able to bring hope to a world in despair and that Jesus will be uplifted and souls will be won for you. Thank you once again, Father for being so good and kind and wonderful. We offer this prayer in no other name, but Christ our love and Savior with thanksgiving. Let us all say, Amen. Amen, Amen. Thank you, uh, Brother Mihaev, indeed. Uh, man, I hope you're feeling the energy and I hope you are ready for another night of the ACL. Uh, if you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you, indeed, uh, that you're in the right place and you are our VIPs. Uh, you are very important persons because the gospel will be proclaimed. And the purpose uh, of uh, what we do here is to save souls uh, that we all can make it to heaven uh, together. Indeed, so we want to uh, invite Brother Kareem Spence, uh, a wonderful, uh, uplifting song leader uh, from the island of Bermuda. Uh, when I met this brother, we had a we had a boom boom time uh, in Bermuda. He loves singing church. I'll tell you that. And uh, even though we are apart, when he sings, you want to sing. All right. And we are singing to the governor of the universe. So let's invite our brother Kareem. Take us to the throne with singing, brother. Brother Kareem. Amen. Amen, brother Safa. Can you hear me? All right. All right. I got a question, man. Has Jesus lifted you? Yeah, yeah. Aren't you glad that Jesus lifted you? Uh, anybody here was bound by Satan, but Jesus lifted them? Uh, anybody down on their knees when Jesus lifted them? Anybody is on their way to heaven because Jesus lifted them. Oh, we ought to thank Jesus, church. We ought to thank him. 
for his marvelous, marvelous work in our life. Let us join a song and let's sing about Jesus lifting us. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me again, church. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me so glad I'm so I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me well I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me with singing glory hallelujah Jesus lifted me that devil Satan had me bound but Jesus lifted me that devil Satan had me bound but Jesus lifted me where Satan had me bound. But Jesus lifted me with singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. I was down on my knees when Jesus lifted me. I was down on my knees when Jesus lifted me. I was down on my knees when Jesus lifted me. We're singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Well, I'm on my way to heaven, cause Jesus lifted me. I was on my way to heaven, cause Jesus lifted me, and I'm on my way to heaven, cause Jesus lifted me. We're singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Oh, well, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me so glad. I'm so, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me with singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me with singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me with singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Where are my hard fighting soldiers? Any hard fighting soldiers in the place today? Yeah? I want to see my hard fighting soldiers. I still see some, cre some screens blanked out now. Where are my hard fighting soldiers? Ah, come on now, church. Let's sing about it. Let's sing about it. Well, I am a fighting soldier, and I'm on the battlefield. I am a fighting soldier, and I'm on the battlefield. I am a fighting soldier, and I'm on the battlefield. And yes, I am bringing souls to Jesus. By the service and a heart, fighting heart, fighting soldier on the battlefield. I am a heart fighting soldier, I'm on the battlefield. I am a heart fighting soldier, I'm on the battlefield. And yes, I am bringing. Jesus, by the service that I give, that I've got a helmet on my head, and in my hand a sword and shield. I've got a helmet on my head, and in my hand a sword and shield. I've got a helmet, it's on my head, and in my hand a sword and shield. And I'm bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I give. But I've got to walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right on the battlefield. I've got to walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right on the battlefield. I've got to walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right on the battlefield, and I'm bringing souls to Jesus 
God of service that I give. Well, I've got a message true and glad it's for the sinful and the sad. I've got a message true and glad it's for the sinful and the sad. I've got a message, it's true and glad it's for the sinful and the sad. And I'm bringing souls to Jesus. By the service that I give, where I am, a fighting soldier, and I'm on the battlefield. I am a fighting soldier, and I'm on the battlefield. I am a hard fighting soldier, and I'm on the battlefield. And I'm bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I give. You know that I'm bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I give. And yes, I am bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I give. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Yes, sir. Praise amen, the Lord. Amen, amen. Glory to God. Amen. You remind me, uh, you know, the first time, I will never forget the first time that I was introduced to the Caribbean electricity man. It was dynamic, was sensational, fabulous, wonderful fellowship, great singing. Uh, thank you, Brother Kareem. Uh, without further ado, we want to uh, invite the first speaker uh, for tonight, uh, which is uh, Brother uh, Justin uh, Ayers. Yes, uh, Brother Justin is a beloved brother uh, here in Grenada and throughout the Caribbean. Yes, uh, we love this brother, and uh, indeed, it's always a pleasure uh, to hear him. After my introduction, uh, you will hear uh, the speaker, uh, who is Brother Adrian Ayers. Adrian Ayers and his family are from the island of Trinidad. He has been married to his amazing wife, Vanessa, for 14 years. And together they have three wonderful children, Dale, Ethan, and Katie. Adrian served as a minister with the San Fernando Church of Christ in Trinidad for 13 years, from 2005 all the way to 2017. And I can hear those from San Fernando Church of Christ saying, Amen. Proud of this brother. Yes, doing this sad. Uh, he, uh, as a minister with the San Fernando Church of Christ, uh, he was a part of the Trinidad School of Preaching from 2011 to 2017. Adrian's ministry experience, uh, experience includes pre presentation on television and radio programs, youth ministries, and leading short-term mission trips. Anyone that knows Brother Adrian knows that this is a worker for the Lord. That's why we love him so much. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Arts in Bible and Divinity from Harding University School of Theology. Adrian now serves as the minister of the Dale City Church of Christ in Virginia. Indeed, it is with much pleasure I introduce to you Brother Adrian Ayers. Preach on, Brother. Pleasant good night to everyone. I trust that you are hearing me well. I bring greetings to you from Dale City, and it is a blessing to see this mosaic of faces, of cultures, of churches, of people that uh, really uh, show the network of faith that we belong to. Um, as I look into uh, the what I have to call an audience, um, I see several people who have uh, nurtured and molded uh, my faith and so it is just a good experience to be able to join together in the Caribbean lectureship uh, in this way and for that reason I'm humbled to be able to uh, make a contribution via this lesson uh, to the lectureship. I'm certainly thankful for the speakers that have gone before who have led the way and those who will come afterward uh, that I know 
will continue to do a great job. I would like us to turn our Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, and verses 15 and 16 will be the text from which our lesson will be taken this evening. Let's keep our fingers on Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 and 16. The book of Isaiah as a whole describes a pattern that God uses to bring his people back to wholeness. Like many of the prophetic writings, God first of all shows his people their sin. He promises that they will be judged for their sin. But then he promises that they will be restored afterward. And in this fashion, Isaiah chapter 1 to chapter 39 portrays the sin of God's people and indicates why they would be judged for it. But from chapter 40 onward, there are repeated images of restoration and comfort and encouragement. And for that reason, this section in which our text falls and our series falls for that matter, from chapter 40 to chapter 55, is often called Second Isaiah. The language, the tone, and the pace of this section, they're different because God wants his people to know what life would look like on the other side of judgment, what life would look like when they are restored. In this section, God tells Israel how and why they will be restored. And God gave them assurance that was designed to move them from disruption to instruction. And that's important because sometimes in life we only see the disruption, but we don't see the instruction. And so Isaiah chapter 49 verses 14 to 15 speaks of how the people Zion felt because of the disruptive effects of God's punishment. You see, the Babylonians had been God's instrument for leading the people into exile and judging them. Babylon burned the city of Jerusalem. The walls were broken down. The city was left vulnerable. Jeremiah, who was left in Jerusalem, he laments and he says that the city was lonely, that was full of people. He says that she has become like a widow who was once a princess. She has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night and there's no one to comfort her. He says the roads to Zion mourn. No one comes to the festivals. The priests are groaning. Lamentations 1 verses 1 to 4. All the icons of God's presence among his people have been snatched away. And so Zion feels this disruption. The people who were in Babylon, as we know, uh, had a song that they sing, a song, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept as we remember Zion. They said on the willows we hung our harps, for there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth saying, sing us one of those Zion songs. You see, worship was not the same in Babylon. It's difficult to sing the songs of ascent that they would normally sing when they went up to the temple because there is no temple. It's difficult to sing of God's past deliverance from Egypt when their present reality feels like bondage. And so worship was at a river instead of at a temple and their songs were reduced to entertainment for their captors instead of praise to their God. In addition to being away from Zion, Israel, they were constantly reminded of the, the power of Babylon every day. In Daniel chapter 3, we see that Nebuchadnezzar set up an image for everyone to bow down and worship. And the scripture says that certain Jews did not bow down to the image, which causes us to infer that it's possible that some Jews actually did. During this time, if you would bear with me to lay this foundation, the Ishtar gate was built in Babylon. It was a gate that uh, was a distinct royal blue with images of golden animals that symbolized Babylon's power and dominance. 
It was typical for Babylon to carve images of their captures being taken in shackles uh, to their land. And so Israel, God's people, probably saw this from time to time. Even as you think about the fact that this is the very area that God took Abraham from and promised him that his people would have their own land, it probably feels like they've taken 10 steps back since they're now in the land of Babylon and not in the land of Israel. So with this backdrop, even though God tells the people, as our uh, speakers before have indicated, that he would raise up a servant who would deliver his people, Isaiah chapter 14, and uh, chapter 49 rather, and verse 14 it says that the people felt forsaken. It says, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. It's possible that some people stop believing in Yahweh. It's possible that some people uh, believe that he was just one of the gods to be served at this point. It's possible that some people did not believe that they were going back to Zion or probably uh, were wondering if they should just serve God in another place. They felt the disruption of being in Babylon. And like Zion, many today may question their faith. We may feel at times that God is not with us. Have you ever felt like that? When we see many who grow up in the church leave the church, when they leave their homes, we feel the disruption. When we see churches dwindling and dying, we see the disruption. When we see that there may be trouble to get people into the career of ministry, the career of preaching, we feel that disruption. When we feel that there's no control over the future, we feel that disruption. Have you ever felt stuck? Have you ever felt down? Have you ever felt depressed? Have you ever felt and questioned, well, what is the meaning of life? If I have no control over the future, it's possibly that I should just exist and tr stop trying to make a difference in the world. This is how Zion felt. They felt forsaken and forgotten. They felt disoriented. And in the midst of this disorientation, God gives them two images in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 and 16, to remind them of who he was. The first image is that of a nursing mother. And so Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 15 says, Can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have compassion on the son of a womb, even they may forget. He says, yet I will not forget you. And this image obviously suggests a close relationship between God and Israel. And we must note that even though God is depicted primarily as father in scripture, that this image is indeed maternal. And it corresponds to the way that Zion is depicted many times in the Old Testament, especially Isaiah. And so in Isaiah chapter 66 from verses 1 to 13, Zion is seen as one who provides nurture to those she nurses. And God says that a mother, just as a mother will not forget her child, God will not forget Israel. God is reminding Israel that he birthed them through the Red Sea, that he took care of them in the wilderness, that he fed them with manna, he gave them quail, he gave them water from the rock. And God is saying that since he took care of them for such a long time, that he would not abandon them. It's like a mother who stretches a few dollars to make ends meet and goes without so that her children can have. It's the motherly instinct to see afar off what the family needs. And it's only later on children realize the sacrifices that the mother would have made for them. God is saying, you don't know Israel what I'm doing for you. But I want you to know that I have not forgotten you. So that's the first image. And the second image that we want to spend a little more time on is the image of an engraving in God's arms. 
The scripture tells us in verse number 16, God says, Behold, he says, Look, I have engraven you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. First of all, we must ask what has been engraved. And I'd like us to know that though our instinct may be to suggest that the name of Israel has been engraved on God's hand, God says that I've engraven you on the palm of my hands. The poetry here suggests that the second line, your walls are ever before me, tells us what has been engraved. And so God has engraved walls on the palm of his hands. Some Christians in the uh, early church would have, uh, would have uh, translated this verse to say, I have painted your walls in the palm of my hands. The concept here is that God has sketched a city or a temple on the palm of his hands. Though Jerusalem was broken down, but though his walls were in ruins, God is saying that I have new blueprints for the city. And these blueprints are so important that I couldn't hide them away somewhere else. I had to put them on the palm of my hands. I had to etch them close to me to let you know what was going to happen. It's interesting that in a temple near Babylon, there's a king who sketched the, the outline of a temple in the lap of a statue that was of him. This was a practice in that day and time. And so with that in mind, God is saying, I have blueprints for a temple. Now, when God says that he has blueprints for a temple, when you reach the stage of drawing up blueprints, you are saying that your plans are no longer just an idea in your mind. You are saying that you want to convey clarity as to what the finished product is going to look like. And so God wants to communicate to his people that he wants them to be clear that they will be restored. This idea of engraving also means to decree, to set, to draw out, to conclude, to conclusion. And so just as Israel's oppressors, uh, Babylon and Egypt and Assyria would carve out images to show their dominance and their power, God is saying it has been decreed, it has been said, his people were going to be restored. And God wants them to know that since he has decreed that they were going to be restored, that they are now called to action. Now, this is important. I wanted to let you know that this is important because God doesn't want to just let the people feel good. All right? God is not just saying that I want you to feel good that you're close to me. God is not just letting the people know that I want you to feel good that you're mine. God is wanting to let the people know that I'm calling you to action. And this is how we know that. Even after the people were delivered from Babylon and they were back in the land by the providence of God, raising up King Cyrus who sent the people back to Jerusalem and even offered to fund the building, the rebuilding of the temple, we see in the books of Nehemiah and in the books of Haggai that the people were still lethargic in getting the work done. It means that even though God has worked and God has stepped up in what he's supposed to do. Sometimes the fact that we feel forsaken and the fact that we feel forgotten causes us to stall on what we're supposed to do. You see, when we feel forsaken and we feel forgotten, we won't act even though God has acted. Even though God has shown his blessing. Even though God has shown what he's supposed to do. And so this, this blueprint on the palm of God's hand is a call to action. It's a call to action. God is saying, I've laid the blueprint. I have the blueprint. But God is saying to his people, you are the builders. Even though you're in your wilderness moment, even though you feel forgotten, even though you feel I'm not with you, God is saying, I'm calling you to action. Now, the reason I know that God could call them to action, even though they're going through these feelings right now, 
It's because God did that before. Do you remember when God delivered the people from Egyptian bondage? God led them through the Red Sea, the scripture says. And when they got to Mount Sinai, God gave them the covenant that uh, established his relationship with them. God did not wait for them to get to Canaan to give them his covenant. But something else happened in the wilderness. And I'd like us to see this for a moment. In the wilderness, God calls Moses to the top of the mountain. And God tells Moses, I have a blueprint for you. It's the blueprint of a tabernacle. God did not wait till they got to Canaan to give Moses the blueprint because the people needed to be, to, for God to be their center and for God to be their focus even in the wilderness. And I want you to know this evening that even in your wilderness, God calls you to action. In the wilderness, God did not tell the people to build chariots because he was the Lord of hosts. He didn't tell them to build storehouses because he was the bread of life. He didn't tell them to build fortresses because he was their shield and their buttress. He told them to build a tabernacle because he was their God. God is saying that your wilderness is a place of worship. That don't matter the position that you're in, don't let your position stop your praise because God has sketched out his plan for you and he's saying that he's going to bring that plan to completion. So Israel tells us we need to worship in the wilderness and we need to call, be called to action. But Abraham also tells us that the Bible tells us that when Abraham traveled from the Earl of the Chaldeans and came into the land of Canaan, that the first thing Abraham did, Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 7, when he got into the land was he built altars and he called on the name of the Lord. That idea of calling on the name of the Lord, that word kara means to worship, but it also means to proclaim. And so when Abraham got into Canaan, he didn't go to the Canaanite altars because he wasn't worshiping the Canaanite God. He's worshiping a distinct God, and that's why that God is called the God of Abraham. Amen, somebody. When Abraham worships this God, and he, he God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Abraham is declaring to the world that something distinct is happening in this place that is not happening in other places. Yes, it was just a rock Abraham built, but it was a place where God met Abraham. And I want us to know that while you're on your journeys, while you're in the wilderness, while you're going through your stuff, while you're going through transitions in life and you feel uh, like that God is not working in your life, don't stop building altars and don't stop building tabernacles to worship your God. Amen. In your car, worship your God. Amen. While you're washing your dishes, worship your God. When things are hard on your job, worship your God. God is saying to Israel, this is a call to action. This is a call to worship me. But secondly, this call to build to to, to build uh, and restore the city of Jerusalem is not only a call to action, it's also a call to unity. See, the engraving on God's hand is a call to build together. And one of the tensions that lie in this text and in the backdrop of the return of the people from exile is the fact that not all of the Jews would have experienced the exile in the same way. And I want to slow down to make this point because I believe it's important. When we think about what's happening in the exile, there would have been people who were old enough to remember what Jerusalem was like, what it meant to worship God in that space. There were people that were old enough to remember the songs, old enough to remember the temple and the feast days, but there were people who were taken to Babylon as children. There were people who were born in Babylon. And so their experience of the exile was different. Esther Perel, who is a psychotherapist who has parents who survived the Holocaust, says that when a community goes through trauma, then 
those who have experienced the trauma have to choose the stories that they pass on. And I wonder what would have been the stories that different people passed on to their children. Some would have said, we sinned and we need to be judged. Some would have said, this is unfair. Why has God done this to us? So people would have experienced the exile differently. Not only that, but there would have been a difference between the people who remained in the land and the people who returned to the land. Ezra chapter 3 tells us that when the people who returned to the land were restoring their forms of worship, that the peoples of the land, those who had mixed and mingled with other nations, gave resistance. The book of Nehemiah also bears this out, that there were people who were pushing against the rebuilding of the wars. And so there was tension in restoration. And this is one of the things that we can notice when we think about the fact that the people feel forsaken. It's not everybody, but it's enough to spread a feeling that God is not with us. This tension teaches us that though we go through the same experience, we may not have the same interpretation of that experience. Not everyone thinks that the congregation is doing fine because some may have different needs. Each generation may experience conflict in the church through different lens in a different way. So when there's conflict and somebody may be fighting over what they think is doctrine and decency, some may just see disunity. Sisters may experience church decisions differently from brothers. Those who grew up in the church may see evangelism efforts and strategies differently from those who were baptized as adults. And when we think about this, it's not a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter of differences. It's a matter of the fact that we all have different perspectives because we all have different experiences. And that's why God calls us to look to the blueprint on his hands. God is saying that his promise overrides my perspective. God is saying that when we look to the blueprint on his hands, what he has promised and what he has decreed overrides what I feel. And so God is calling all of us to this rebuilding and restoration project. God is calling young and old. God is calling women and men, new converts and stalwarts because restoration means that we need everyone. And so I want to encourage us when we see that things aren't going the way that we think they should go, don't just show up, sign up. Don't just be present, be active. Don't just be in uh, the church, be active in the church. We need all hands. And sometimes when we have all hands on deck, it would mean that we would need to look at how we do ministry uh, differently. Sometimes it would mean that we need to reassess the difference between God's commands and our traditions. Sometimes we may, learn, we may need to learn to hear the voice of millennials and Gen Zs because they are not people that are a problem to be solved. They are part of the body who bear the image of God not to be ministered to but to be ministered with so that we can experience what it is to have true intergenerational ministry. Sometimes we may need to hear the voices, learn to hear the voices of our sisters and learn to see the contributions that they can make even though they may not be preachers and the elders, they have a valuable role in the kingdom. God is calling us to restoration and he has set this blueprint on his hands, a call to action and a call to unity. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ also calls us to action when he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, how do we know that that project, how do we know that what Jesus has promise is going to come to pass. There's a, another engraving Jesus would have had on his hands 
When he died on the cross, there were nails that pierced his hands and he kept those scars for his disciples to see that he was risen from the dead. We also have those engravings to remind us of the power of God, of the plan of God, of the purpose of God, and the fact that our ministries ought to be centered on God. They ought to be centered on Jesus Christ. God has the blueprint, but we are the builders. Let's continue to build because God's plans are engraved on his hands as he calls us to be a light to the nations. I pray that God will bless all of us as we continue to do God's work and be a light to the nations. Amen, 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 Brother Adrian. Thank you, Brother I mean, if, if, if you were listening, you know, somebody texted the chat line, I-K-T-R. I know that's right. Yes, thank you, uh, Brother Adrian, uh, for that encouraging message that we ought to follow the blueprint uh, of our great God. Thank you, Brother. God bless you uh, and your family. I hope you're encouraged like I am. Uh, indeed, it's a blessing uh, to get such wonderful, uh, wonderful messages, messages throughout the week. Thank you, Brother. God bless you uh, and your ministry also. Yes, uh, this time we want to call on Brother Gladwin Kidu, uh, the director of the Jamaica School of Preaching, uh, that he can do a presentation and uh, also give an invitation uh, for others to come and to be a part of the of the school. Oh yes, IKTR, I know that's right, Brother Adrian. Oh yes, sir. Uh, the blueprint is right. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so, Brother Kiddo, uh, Brother Gladwin, are you on? Uh, this is time for you to make your presentation. All right. Brother Gladwin seems not to be on yet. Okay. Uh, well, if we don't hear him as yet, probably he's not on as yet. Yes, or probably he was on and off. But listen, let's let's continue the sweet fellowship. You know, after such a wonderful sermon, we need some beautiful singing. Yes, we call him Brother Sean Williams. Yes, Brother Sean uh, Williams is a member, uh, well, was a member uh, of the Williamsville Church of Christ in Trinidad. Yes, but uh, he has married a wonderful wife right here in Grenada. And uh, so he gave up Trinidad for Grenada. Yes, uh, but he's a wonderful brother. He loves to sing, still love his home country. And uh, indeed, uh, someone who uh, can be encouraging and to be around. Yes, we want to invite Brother uh, Sean Williams uh, to lead us in a few songs. Brother Sean. Well, good night to the people of God. See you guys having a wonderful, wonderful time. Let us sing. There is much to do. There is much to do. Let's sing. There is much to do. There is work on every hand. I tell God for help. I'm straying through the land. Jesus called for me, but I must not be free. What will thou, O Master? Here am I, send me, I'm saved. Oh, so 
straight into our second speaker tonight. Uh, indeed, it's uh, another pleasure of mine uh, to have this opportunity to introduce to you a friend of mine, Brother uh, Elton uh, Terry. Uh, Brother Elton Terry is a native Antiguan and a graduate of the Jamaica School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. He graduated from Harding University in Arkansas, USA, with a bachelor's degree in Bible and ministry 
and went on to earn a Master of Divinity degree from Harden School of Theology in Memphis, Tennessee. Along with preaching the gospel, Brother Terry is a gifted teacher with 25 years experience in both church and secular environment. And those of us who uh, play a part in this Caribbean lectureship, we know how gifted uh, our brother truly is. Uh, so before taking up his current position as evangelist for the St. Thomas Church of Christ in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Brother Terry served the Patrick Gardens, Mona Heights, and St. Andrew congregation in Jamaica, primarily as a Bible class teacher for several years each. Since 2011, Brother Terry has been teaching the adult Bible class at the annual Caribbean Lectureship. He, also, he has also delivered several keynote addresses at the event. In 2014, Brother Terry accepted the invitation to become a member of the ACL Regional Organizing Committee and continues to serve the Brotherhood in that capacity. Brother Terry is a married man to Sophia since July uh, 2012. Indeed, brethren and friends, it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Brother Terry. And I, like I said, brethren, we know that this man loves God, spends much time preparing, and indeed delivers for the great God that he serves. Preach on, Brother Terry. A pleasant good evening to everyone. Um, Brother Asafa, thank you very much. Are you hearing me clearly? You can just give me a sound check. All right, thank you. And I, before I go any further, I just want to commend uh, Brother Adrian Ears for such a, just a marvelous, wonderful presentation. Um, to God be the glory. Uh, I just want to check to see if I can get my share, my, my screen shared. Um, so let me just see what I have here. Uh, could you tell me, Osafa, if I'm, this, she, this screen comes up? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Great. Wonderful. Um, do I need to go full screen or is that okay the way it is? Full, full screen might be better, Elvin. Uh, so that's it? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Again, a pleasant good evening to everyone. And we give God thanks uh, for the feasting that we have had. Uh, so far, not only tonight, but for the, the nights that have gone before. Um, we really want to give God thanks for the preaching of his word. Um, to, his, to his name be all the, the glory. I have been assigned uh, this topic uh, tonight uh, out of Isaiah 49, verses 19 to 21. And um, as I listened to Brother Adrian, I thought to myself, well, uh, if, if the preacher who goes before you is just a few verses before you, then there more than likely is going to be some overlapping in terms of what might be expressed in the outset. And um, so I suspect it's going to be. But I want to start off tonight by drawing your attention to a story that I find very fascinating. Uh, for most of us who may be familiar with the American actor, uh, Terry Crews, there's a new series called uh, Finding Your Roots. Um, I think it is supported by Ancestry.com. And so what they do in this series is to allow, especially black people, who want to know what their roots are, how far back can they find their roots um, in history. And so Terry Crews, uh, that episode, they did his. And one of the things they found out was that they were able to trace his roots all the way back to his fourth great-grandmother and grandfather. They were born in 1820. And his grandmother, Fanny, Fanny had about seven children. And then in 1858, when her master died, of course, this is the time of slavery, when her master died in 1858, Fanny was unfortunately separated from five of her children 
And so can you imagine what that would mean as a child or as a mother? Today you see your mother or today you see your children and tomorrow you don't. So certainly then for Fanny, she was now in danger of never seeing some of her children again. But as fate would have it, in 1861, she was united with two of her children. And then, a couple of years after, she was united with the rest. And so in 1870, the entire family, the census on that family, indicated that Fanny and all her children were united and living together again. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing story. It's a, it's a wonderful story about what can happen uh, when there is loss and when there is a post-restoration. I want to say to us tonight that even today, as in ancient times, children represent the greatest evidence or manifestation of divine favor or, and blessing upon a woman even more so than a man. So in Psalm 127 and verse 3, the psalmist says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And we can remember Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 when Hannah prays and she says, Lord, um, if you will just bless me with a son. And in her focus, she wants the shame that she's bearing to be removed. And so she pleads with the Lord to bless her with a son. Therefore, we can understand that the loss of a child or the loss of children has the potential to destroy. It has the potential to destroy the joy of motherhood. It has the potential to destroy faith in the divine. And therefore, it also has the potential to destroy any hope that we may have in the future. The question in which this title for this message is framed, and also the text associated with this sermon, are of great importance to everyone who is listening this evening, especially as we are emerging from the depth of a devastating pandemic. And I'll tell you, it is important because in times of great loss and suffering, human beings have a tendency or an inclination to dive into deep depression. We have an inclination to wallow in doubt. We have an inclination to throw away our faith in God. And we also have an inclination to ridicule any thought or imagination of any hope for a better tomorrow. And so the aim of this lesson for tonight is threefold. First, I want to highlight three significant ideas within the question that is the title of this sermon. Who has borne me these? Secondly, I want to encourage self-examination of one's thinking, one's behavior, and one's attitude in the face of overwhelming odds and deep disappointment. And thirdly, I want to stimulate the appropriate or proper response out of the recognition of God's goodness to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so I want us to look at this passage, the passage that is assigned for this sermon tonight. Uh, the text reads as follows, verse 19, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 19 to 21. And this is from the ESV. It says, surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land. Surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants and those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, this place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, 
I was left alone. From where have these come? You see, this passage is a very, very important passage. It is a powerful passage. And I want to say to us that a passage like this, this passage is actually a short poetic tale about blessings. It is a short poetic tale about the source of blessings received. It is a short poetic tale about the anguish of blessings lost. And it is a short poetic tale about the amazement of blessings restored. But before anyone can fully appreciate the greatness of this tale, this story, he or she must step back into ancient Israelite history and understand the details of God's covenant with Abraham. You see, yes, God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. But it is actually in Genesis chapter 15, verse 17 to 18, after Abraham complained to God, that God cut or made a covenant with Abraham and promised him a threefold blessing. You see, when God said to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, that I will bless you and I'll give you offspring, God promised him that he'll get land and God promised him that he'll have a name and then God promised him also that he'll have descendants. But if you remember the story, by the time you get to chapter 15 with Abraham and Lot, when Lot took the better part of the land, God says to Abraham, don't worry about it. Your reward will be great. But Abraham says, but how can my reward be great? Lord, paraphrasing here, says, I am yet to see the children you promised to bless me with. So Abraham called out God to say, well, you are telling me that my reward is going to be great, but I'm yet to see a child born to me. And then God, the Bible tells us, cut a covenant with Abraham. And there then you have the covenant established with Abraham that God is going to bless him with this land. God is going to bless him with a name. God is going to bless him with descendants, meaning offspring or seed or children, whichever one suits you better. As history would unfold, in fulfillment of his promise to Abraham, God eventually quickened or brought to life the dead womb of Sarah who gave birth to Isaac. In commitment to honor his covenant with Abraham, God later renewed the same covenant promise with Isaac and also with Jacob. In remembrance of his covenant to Abraham, God eventually raised up Moses to lead the descendants of Abraham from the center of Egypt to the border of Canaan. But in what would have appeared to be a total abandonment of God's promise to Abraham, God permitted the devastation of Jerusalem by the king of Babylon and the deportation, the, the deportation of, his, of its inhabitants to a foreign land. And this was approximately 600 years before Christ. In the portion of this text, that is a sign for this topic, Zion is personified as a mother who is in deep despair and great anguish over the loss of her children. Children whom she thought she would never see again. And I think mothers, all mothers in the audience tonight, if you have ever lost a child, I can imagine that you can understand how this feels. You see, this poetic section of scripture imagines a dialogue between God and Zion in which God affirms his love for the descendants of Abraham and his tireless commitment to their welfare. Because it is dressed in poetic garb as well as the fact that historic, historical facts cannot be denied or ignored, this text in Isaiah ought to be read it ought to be heard, it ought to be interpreted, and it ought to be understood figuratively to a meaningful extent. It ought to be understood with a view to see Zion in this text as representative 
of the community of all believers who have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the suffering servant of Yahweh in Isaiah's prophecy. So there are a couple of things here with this passage. There are three things I want to highlight in the text. First of all, I want us to see that in this question, who has borne me these? In this question, there is a focus. Zion is challenged to focus her attention on the source of her blessings. And so it is for all of us. We will have to at some point, when we are experiencing particular challenges, there is this question that is important. Who has borne me all these? So the question focuses Zion's attention on the source of her blessing. You see, the entire, the, the, this, this, this pronoun who, this interrogative pronoun who, it points to a source. It points to the origin. It points to the fountainhead of all blessings received. You see, because the neighbors of ancient Israel would agree that some divine being or entity is the source of blessings. The Babylonians had their God. The Egyptians had their God. All the nations around Israel at the time had their various gods. And in the literature that is available about them, they all, to some extent, understood that blessings somehow come from God. But Israel's God is no generalized deity. Israel God will not be categorized in generalization. Unlike the gods of Israel's contemporary neighbors, Israel's God is unique. He is uniquely self-existent. Israel's God is personal. Israel's God is relational. And Israel's God is moral. His self-disclosed name to Moses is Yahweh. I am what I am. So the question placed on Zion's lips ought to tug at Zion's memory of the God who entered a covenant relationship with Abraham and his descendants. Even as Zion is in anguish, personified as a woman, who is in anguish over the loss of her children, not knowing if she will ever see them again. God put these words on Zion's lip. For Zion to remember, to talk on Zion's memory, for Zion to remember what Moses warned when he says, Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power, by my power and the might of of my might have I begotten this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. He is the one who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Zion, therefore, was challenged to take seriously what the Lord himself declares. I am Yahweh. That is my name. And my glory I will give to no other. So when we think about uh, our times of loss and our time of, of dismay and disappointment, we have to be careful that we forget the ultimate source of the very blessings that we are crying over. So this, this text focuses on attention. Even when we are in the midst of loss, we need to remember the very things that we have lost. Where did they come from? What is the source of the very things that we are mourning their loss? You see, remember, this is what God says to Jonah when, 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 when Jonah was, was reluctant. And God says to Jonah, listen, this, this tree that you took such comfort in, where did that tree come from? 
And so sometimes the very things that we take shelter in and the very things that we take pride in, when those things, for whatever reason, God permits their removal from our lives, we still have to remember that ultimately those things came into our lives by the very providence and favor and grace of Almighty God. So everyone would do well this evening. Everyone will do well to actively listen to what James says when he writes that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift. If you have ever received what you consider to be a good and perfect gift, James says we must bear in mind that those things came from above. And so sometimes when we have to lose those things, when for whatever reason, whether by a hurricane, or whether by an earthquake, or whether by some other form of disaster, whether the very job that we were blessed with, for whatever reason, we were fired. When from the very position we held in a company, we understood that we are going to be demoted or even dismissed. What we once considered a blessing, when these things are taken from us, this text is challenging us to remember ultimately what is the source of our blessing. Who has borne me these? Who? And so for Zion, this was important for her to bear in mind. You see, this was sort of different. What James says in James chapter 1 and verse 1 was sort of different from how the people of ancient Greco-Roman society understood things. You see, in that world, in the world of the first Christians, in the Greco-Roman world of the first century, they had a God, a different God for almost everything. And so you had a God for health. Then you had a God for victory. Then you had a God for fortune. Then you had a God for wine. And you could go on and on. The, the list could go on and on. For everything that they consider to be good, it comes at the hand of a different God. Well, no. Uh, Christianity, the people who are the descendants of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, there is this understanding that there is no difference between the gifts that we have and the source. Ultimately, everything we have come from this one God. And the Bible tells us that this one God is no other God than the very God who called Abraham out of her of Chaldees and made this promise to him that through his descendants he will be blessed and all the nations of the world will be blessed. So you hear Paul's presentation. First in with two presentations for Paul. First in Lystra, in Acts chapter 14 and verse number 17, when there were people, you see, this is they wanted to worship Paul. And Barnabas as a God, as God's. And so Paul had to sort of hold his ground and to let them know, no, we, we, we are not some gods as you think we are. We are human beings like you are. And then he says to them, let me tell you something about this God that you ought to be seen. This God did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You see, this is Paul's message. When you think about the, the, the blessings that you have, you know, we, for most of us in the Caribbean, I think for a lot of parts in the world, we are currently experiencing a drought. And if we are not careful, we will find that we are now uh, very disappointed. I am very disappointed that the, 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 the pear tree in the yard, the pear is just not getting any water. But then I have to remember that the years that I've had pear off the pear tree, those pears came from God. And if God for one year is allowing a drought so that the pear production is not what I would like it to be, I still have to say thank God for the pears that I have received in previous times. And it is still God who is able to bless 
me with whatever I need in life. And, and so it is for us as Christians, we have to remember even when we suffer the loss of the things that we have received from God and held dear, we cannot get into a position where we forget that it is God who gave us those things. And so when Paul gets into Athens in Acts chapter 17, and he had to remind these people again, there are altars for all sorts of God. And he found that there's an altar for a God that they figured they didn't know this one. So just in case we miss him out, let us give him an altar. And we call it an altar to the unknown God. And so Paul says, let me tell you about that God that you call unknown. He said, that God is the God who made the world and everything in it the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in temples made by hand, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything, in him we live and move and have our being for we are his offspring. And he's quoting from some of those contemporary Greek poets. What he said, what these poets have said to Zeus really should be ascribed to Yahweh, the God of Israel. What they say is true. They have just directed the praise to the wrong person. They have just sent the praise to the wrong address. The praise should be given to God. This is the God that they should really be talking about. But the point that they made is true. We are God's offspring. But when we talk about God, Israel and the descendants of Abraham in Christ would say there is only one God. There's only one true and living God. And so that is one of the first things we have to understand in this text, that it focuses our attention. If we are Zion, if Zion represents the faithful community of God, then this question should focus our attention on the source of all our blessings. And secondly, I want us to bear in mind that this question, who has borne me these, it also challenges Zion's inclination to doubt and despair in times of great loss. It challenges Zion's inclination to doubt and despair in times of great loss. You see, the text, the children of your bereavement, Zion is in bereavement. It also says that Zion is uttering these words, verse 21, I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. Then the text says Zion is speaking to say also, I was left alone. I want to tell you, brethren, that sometimes uh, when we lose, when we have lost some of the things that we have treasured and valued in our lives, things that we figure we will always have, and that includes so many things in our lives, when those things go, Christians, even believers, even the descendants of Abraham by faith, we are sometimes inclined to great doubt and we are inclined to great despair. You see, the children of your bereavement, this speaks specifically to the loss of a child, not only from the perspective of parental grief, but it also speaks in terms of economic possibilities. So it's not just the grief of the parent, but the loss also not just the loss of the child physically, but there's also the loss of the opportunity, the economic opportunity that that child should offer. And it's the same thing with any of our blessings. When we lose our blessings, we're not necessarily only losing the blessing itself, but we are losing what are the spillers, what also come, what those blessings bring to us. And so if we're not careful then, we will go into great doubt. We will start to enter into great despair because we figure, no, God has really treated me badly. 
This was a common sense in the ancient Near East. There's a contemporary text from ancient Ugaric where a woman whose child was bitten by a snake, she appealed to her god, Horanu. And she says to Horanu very much the same line that is expressed here. She says, I have been bereaved of my offspring. So you see, she appealed to her God. God has often said to his people that in our time of loss, it is for us to look to him and not to look to any other. You see, in the sense of abandonment that we may feel sometimes, we are tempted to walk away from God. We are tempted to turn our eyes away from things church and from all things spiritual. But that is not advised. And this question, who has brought me these, is a challenge to this inclination to doubt and despair in a great time of loss. You see, in times of crisis, the unbelieving world may even taunt the Christian, may taunt the believer. As was done in Psalm 40, as the psalmist cried out in Psalm 42 and verse number 3, when the psalmist says, people will say to me, where is your God? How many times have the faithful people of God may be hearing this? When they see Christians who go through difficult times and Christians who endure hardship, and so if you are a Christian, then you should not be experiencing such loss. Isn't that the same thing that Job friends said to him? Job, listen man, we know that these things do not happen to righteous people. We know that if you were living right, these things do not happen to you. And as most of us will be aware that Job could not find any consolation in the comfort that they are trying to offer. He described them as miserable comforters. You see, because when we have lost, when we have suffered the loss of blessings, the world, the unbelieving world, will look at that and say, see, that is evidence that there is no God. That is evidence that what you are worshipping or who you are worshipping really is not as loving as you profess him to be. But the Christian has to be strong. The Christian has to be a, 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 a tower of, of strength to say, no, ultimately, God is God. And as Job actually says, it is the law that gives, and it is the law that what? Take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, Asaph, in Psalm 73, Asaph confessed that he almost lost his footing when he looked at his life and he saw the life of the wicked, how the wicked was prospering. And he saw his hardship. And he says, oh boy, when I look at the prosperity of the wicked, he says, I almost lose my footing. He says, I almost stumble. But then he started his, his, the, the psalm by saying, truly God is good to Israel. Truly God is, go, is good to his people. And so we are reminded by Paul to the church in Philippi, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, make your request be made known to God. And God is able. Psalm 55 of verse 22, where the psalmist says, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he what? For he cares for you. This is something that Peter picks up in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 7 when he echoes the sentiment. At a time when the, the, the church in the first century, in the time of when Peter is writing, suffering all sorts of social hostility, there is this message to cast your care upon the Lord for he cares for you. Many of us have seen many terrible times and we have experienced some real challenges during the pandemic. There are brethren who have lost their job. There are brethren, there are people who have lost loved ones. There are people who have lost 
a certain amount of even their pride and their dignity. And I want to say to these persons tonight, the pandemic really took a toll on many of us. But then we have to start to look at it and say, hey, um, God is good. And whatever God does is done well. And so we celebrate. We praise God still. Even when the very things that we took pleasure in, the very things that we delight in, even when those things are removed from us, we still give God thanks for having blessed us with those things in the first place. You see, Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 35, Paul asks this question, what shall separate us from the love of God? What shall separate us from the love of God? Is it going to be famine? Is it going to be hardship? Is it going to be, you know, and, and there's the list. What shall separate us from the love of God? As far as Paul is concerned, it doesn't matter what we face in the world. We still have to be inclined to look to God and to give God thanks for what he has blessed us with. Finally, I want to suggest that in this text, there's the question, the question, who has borne thee these? It also amplifies Zion's utter amazement in the face of God's act of restoration. Utter amazement. So you see here, God says to Zion, your children, your children will return and your children will say to you, the place is too narrow. You don't have enough space. And now this is amazing. This is, this is truly amazing, right? So the very children that Zion was weeping over and in great distress about, God says, I am going to restore them to you. But that restoration is going to be so abundant that the children themselves are going to find that you do not have enough space. Verse 20. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell. Do you understand what's going on here, brethren? That when God chooses to restore the blessings. The blessings come in such waves and in such abundance that there is not space for Zion to contain. There is not space for Zion, for the blessings to be held in Zion. Of course, as I said to you before, we have to read this in a sort of figurative, meaningful way. It means then that God, when God chooses to restore the blessings that his people have lost, in their time of challenge or time of, 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 of difficulty, God will restore these blessings in such abundance that it will utterly amaze us. You remember Job? After all that Job lost, the Bible tells us at the end of Job that Job's fortunes were restored to him. Everything Job had was doubled. The only thing that was not doubled was the children. And of course, theologians have the ideas about why that is so. But Job received the double portion for all that he lost. You see, this is what God says to Zion. You, 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 yes, just know that when I restore to your children, you are not going to have space to contain them. The blessings themselves are going to cry out for space on the shelf to be held. What a God we serve, right? So, Zion asks this question in her amazement. Who has brought up these? You know, so in this question is the sense that is there some sort of surrogate mother who has given birth to these children for me? Who has been caring? Who, who has been nurturing these children? It, I mean, can you imagine the, the, the sense that Zion uh, is, is feeling? in this poetic sense, that what I am receiving, I cannot really believe I am receiving. From where 
have this call. And we have this call. Listen, we listened to Brother Sanderson last night. And what an amazing message. But do you remember what Brother Sanderson says about his own children? The body remember? That he said he thought he had, yeah, there was two. And now he has been blessed with how many? And I see you shaking your head, carrying. Do you remember that statement? When I when I said that, I said, boy, the Lord provide good, good, good things for your sermon to come. Brother Sanders, Brother, Brother Sanderson's testimony last night bears relation to this. Oh, he told us about the losses that he suffered. He told us about the difficulties that he endured. But wow, look at how God has blessed him. And this is what this is what God is saying to, 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 to Zion. This is what God is saying to the people, the descendants of Abraham by faith in Christ. When I decide to restore to you the blessings you have lost, you are not going to have space to contain them. You are not going to have space to contain them. You are going to be so utterly amazed that you are going to wonder where were they, how were they nurtured, and from where did they come. As one Old Testament uh, scholar says about this verse, he says, Zion had thought herself bereaved of her children and hopelessly barren, never to replace them. Now she finds them swarming around her and she expresses amazement in simple, almost naive exclamation. Did some mysterious surrogate mother give birth to all these for me? These, from where have they come? This is a picture of the abundance that comes to us when God chooses to restore to us what we have lost in his own time. Because God is faithful to his covenant with Abraham and his offspring, Zion's decimation and loss will be replaced by abundant blessings or children, not only in terms of economic abundance, but also in terms of hopefulness for the future. Therefore, says the psalmist, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, we will not fear. Psalm 46 and verse 2. Paul. This is how Paul describes his sense of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul says to the brethren in Corinth, As servants of God, as servants of God, we live or we exist as having nothing, as having nothing yet possessing everything. As having nothing yet possessing everything. Wow. Remember that Jesus did inform his disciples in the Beatitudes. He says to them, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. There is a sense, brethren, that the, the meek, those who are humble and those who surrender themselves to the will of God, even as they go through their hard times, even as they hold their power under control so that they can remain faithful to God, God says that these are the people, these are the people who will truly enjoy the abundance of the earth. Sometimes we may not own the things, but God will make sure that we enjoy them. It's one of the, it's one of the amazing things about God. We do not have to own the stuff, but God will see to it that we enjoy them. I don't know how many, how many free nights some of you have gotten. I don't know how many free food some of you have gotten. I don't know how many free things some of you have gotten because God has chosen to bless you through the hands and generosity of others. People sometimes that you're not even so certain why they are assisting you. Sometimes you're not even certain why people are being so generous to you. Sometimes you even question, what have I done to deserve the goodness that I am receiving? But that is God. That is God choosing to bless the descendants of Abraham according to his promise. So with the limitations, I want to say that if somebody reads Isaiah 49 and it reminds them of this old mother goose nursery rhyme, there was 
an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she did not know what to do. My Karim, you look as if you are not up on your nursery rhymes, man. Yeah. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she did not know what to do. When, when, I, when, I, when I was reading this passage, that came to my mind. I said, oh, wow. But this woman had so many children, she didn't know what to do. What I want to say to us tonight, we know what we can do, we know what we should do. So I have a suggestion for us. I want to challenge us. As I close, I want to challenge us, first of all, to create a list of all the ways in which God has blessed you, especially over the past few years. Create that list. I want to challenge you to take the time, literally take the time. I don't create a list in your mind. You literally take pen and paper and create a list. Think of all the ways that God has blessed you. Think of all the ways that God has blessed your congregation. Think about all the ways that God has blessed your family, especially over the past few years. No, it doesn't have to confine it to the past few years, but especially over the past few years. Make that list. We must intentionally, brethren, pause at times to really consider the blessings of God in our life. Then I, this is what I want you to do. This is what I'm challenging us to do. After you have made the list, I want to challenge you to set aside seven minutes. I'm going to say seven because seven is the biblical perfect number. I'm going to say seven times. Seven minutes. Set aside seven minutes each day just to say a prayer of thanksgiving for only one thing on your list. One thing. Every day. Look at your list and spend seven minutes in prayer, just a prayer of thanksgiving for that thing on your list. And hopefully there, what you'll see, you will step through the list over a number of days. What that will do for us, it will keep us in a very grateful, in a very appreciative mode each day that we get up. I want to challenge us to do that. Because you see, brethren, there comes a time when we must thoughtfully express thanks to God for his blessings in our lives. And finally, I want to challenge us. You create the list. So I challenge you to create the list. I am challenge you to set aside seven minutes a day to pray for an item on your list. But I also want to challenge you to make a vow. Make a vow. And we know what the Bible says about making vows to the Lord. So I want to challenge us to make a vow, to share what we have given thanks for each day with someone who is not yet a Christian. Just share with someone each day that thing that you have given thanks for in the morning that you pray. Because, you see, I want to, to encourage us, brethren, to take on this posture. That we must be people who are joyfully, joyful like a teenager in love. To tell others about how much we have been blessed by God. You see, this is kind of how we are. We become the light, a light, a reflecting light to the nation. You see, that is what Peter says. That we have a responsibility to show forth to the world the excellencies of the mercies of God in our lives. And one of the ways I want to challenge us tonight to do that is to make this list, pray through this list, but also make a vow to share with others the items on your list that you are thankful for. Share with someone who's not yet a Christian. Let someone who's not yet a Christian know and can see and can hear from you how thankful and how grateful you are, how utterly amazed you are for the abundance of blessing in your lives, even in the difficult times in which we are living. You see, during the Terry Crews family story, the narrator described the reunion as a miracle. In Crews' own words, the reunion had to be spectacular, he says. Through Isaiah 49, verse 21, God has promised all the faithful descendants of Abraham that he will abundantly restore all that was lost to our utter amazement. In Christ's hopelessness, 
will become hope. We need to remember that Abraham was one who hoped against hope. Zion, which represents the redeemed people of God, is invited to do the same thing. In the text of Isaiah 49, verse 9 to 21, then, reaffirms a profound truth about God and his engagement with the descendants of Abraham. But if we are too despondent to grasp it now, God will carry us until we can. If you are not a Christian tonight and if you desire to become a child of Abraham through faith in Christ, we want to invite you to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Messiah that was promised by Isaiah, the servant of God, to repent of your sins and to, to confess with your mouth that you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and to be baptized for the mission of your sins. And then you can be numbered among the citizens of Zion, the descendants of Abraham by faith in Christ. And whatever you have lost, God has promised to restore to you in great abundance, greater than you can even imagine. To your own utter amazement, God has promised to restore to us one day the blessings that we have lost. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yes, somebody say, wow, uh, who has borne me these? Uh, even in a narrow place, God's love and his blessing are still bountiful. Amen, Brother Terry, amen. God bless you, brother. Thank you for uh, that challenge also uh, that we as children of God are to love the take up because it will bless of growth in Christ Jesus. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I want to uh, just thank you for that, Brother Terry, and indeed, God continue to bless you in your ministry, Brother, along the way. Yes, sir. Amen. All right, we want to have uh, Brother Kareem uh, Spencer lead us in a song uh, that goes along with the uh, message uh, of tonight, and then after this song, we will have Brother uh, Gladwin Kiddo to uh, present based on the uh, Jamaica School of Preaching. Brother Kareem. Count your blessings. Let us join in song. When upon life builds you a tempest torn, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Just a short distance, the turning bear. Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflicts, whether great or small, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to the journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. 
Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, brother. Thank you so much. Yes. Count your many blessings. That's the sermon right there. And name them one by one, even when you're in a tough place, even in difficult circumstances. God is able. Amen. All right. Uh, we want to invite uh, Brother Gladwin Kiddo as we try to get him up to present about the Jamaica School of Preaching and Biblical International. Brother Kiddo, go ahead. We are so glad to be here this evening, and I want to thank Brother Elton Terry for our wonderful message, and I'm sure that he has blessed us all. I'm so glad that this lectureship has a particular theme, and the theme of worldwide evangelism is really what the Jamaica School of Preaching is all about. We have been renamed the Jamaica School of Preaching Biblical Studies International founded in 1970 by a group of American missionaries and led by a Caribbean staff since 1979. And this staff led by myself, Brother York, Brother York being my deputy, assisted by Brother Joel Perrot, and Brother Bai Kid, who is now the administrator of the school in terms of day-to-day -day operations. And we have a wide set of members of staff, some of whom have retired in terms of this photograph, but some are still serving. The JSP has a world vision, and that is to teach to all continents of the world. We started in Kingston, Jamaica in 1970, but we believe that the Great Commission applies to us also. And so today we have students in 22 different countries across four different continents. We are in Africa, in Uganda, in Asia, in India, in uh, ne Nepal, and other countries in Asia. We are in North America, South America, and we are planning over the next 12 months to be involved in Europe. And so we thank God for the team that is involved in this uh, great work for Almighty God. And our leadership is not just centered in Jamaica. Brother Jorge Kianos is the, the leader of the JSP program in Mexico. Brother Didier Hernandez leads our program in Cuba. Brother Joe Presta is director of JSP Asia and North America. Luis Pedreza teaches to South America. And Brother Peter is coordinating our program in Uganda in Africa. And we have two programs, our full-time four-year degree program and our part-time online and live set of classes. And uh, this, our program is really extremely ex extensive. The degree program offers both Greek over four years and Hebrew at least for at least one year, the Hebrew language. Then we offer four years of homiletics. We go through every book of the Bible. We have 240 Bible credit hours being offered in our degree program. And in our full-time program at present, we have students from Haiti, Jamaica, Guyana, and St. Lucia. And we invite those who are interested in our programs just to apply to jspmona.org and find out more about our full-time and also our part-time diploma program. We will go through all the books of the Bible, Greek language, homiletics, church history, church leadership, just to name a few. So in Jamaica, we offer extension programs online, on Sundays, on Mondays, and on Fridays. But to 22 different countries across the globe, including Bangladesh, Belize, Bermuda, Canada, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, we have live classes. We offer classes uh, across the globe, and we thank God for this situation. Of course, COVID-19 has affected us, and our campaign efforts, which would normally be going on every year, have been halted. But our last campaign was in 2019 at the Fruitful Vale Congregation, and here are some of our staff members and students who were involved in that campaign. But the big thing for us in the period of COVID-19 was the launch of our work in Costa Rica. Would you believe it that we are teaching to Costa Rica every other Saturday online. And the teacher 
his brother Louis Pedreza, who formerly was director of JSB Cuba. And now he's teaching to eight different countries, not just in Costa Rica, but throughout the South American uh, continent. And we just give God thanks for this. You know, recently we had this amazing event where eight doctors turned up in Jamaica from Cuba. And they turned up at the St. Anne's Bay Church of Christ. And most of them were members of the Church of Christ, converted in Cuba because the JSP has been involved in Cuba for over 30 years. And now, turning up at a church in Jamaica where a group of doctors recruited by the Jamaican government and are helping now in the evangelizing of Jamaica and, of course, helping our medical system in Jamaica. And in February, Brother Jose Louis Bosch came to us from Cuba. He's Jamaican Cuban and he has moved to Jamaica. He's bringing his family here shortly. He's from uh, Grandma Province in the southern part of Cuba. Think about this. His congregation meets in the preacher's house in Cuba. Now, the Cuba they don't, don't allow you to build church buildings. He has a 60 member congregation. His congregation is led by a preacher who was, con who was, who was trained in JSB Cuba's program that's been going on for 30 years. He himself was led to Christ by a graduate of the JSB Cuba program. And so Brother Bosch is now enrolled in our extension program in Jamaica. And we intend to use him to teach in Spanish to Spain over the next few years. So our next stop in terms of worldwide training is Europe. And we are going to use Spain as our bridge to get into Europe. And so we welcome Brother Bosch to Jamaica. And so there's a God in heaven. And to God be the glory. The Jamaica School of Preaching is an international school operating in four different continents. With teachers from the Caribbean, from Grenada, from St. Vincent, from Jamaica, teachers from Canada. Teachers, teachers from the United States, we have a worldwide reach. And why are we doing this? Because God gave us the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And secondary to that, Paul said, teach faithful men who will teach others also. And so the Jamaica School of Preaching is all about teaching faithful men and women who can share and train others in other parts of the world. And we intend to carry on this work until we are teaching in all seven continents of the world. And it all started in Jamaica in April of 1970. To God be the glory. Anyone who's interested in our part-time or full-time program, you can go to our website jsbmona.org and get further information. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for that presentation for the kiddo uh, and the good work that you guys are doing. God bless you uh, and may that continue uh, to go well. So you have heard it. If you desire and uh, you desire or someone else you know have the desire all right you can uh, join the jamaica school of preaching international yes uh, whether you are to be uh, part-time or full-time yes indeed it would bless your life in a great way thank you uh but a kiddo yes so brethren and friends uh we want to say a special thanks to our two speakers tonight uh indeed they uh, filled us with God's wonderful words. Uh, we say thank you to Brother Adrian and thank you to Brother uh, Terry. God bless you both in your ministries. Yes, as we wrap down tonight, brethren and friends, the, the fun, the fellowship doesn't stop here. All right, tomorrow night, brethren and friends, all right, we have song leaders, Junior Smith, all the way from Guyana. Yes, we have also our brother Oliver Bemridge. We know what this brother can do when he gets singing. Yes, we have speakers uh, tomorrow, brother Kevin Carson, Isaiah 49 and verse number 26, enlightened through God's judgment. Hmm. 
looking forward. And then we have Brother Nigel Milo. Oh yes, Isaiah 49, verse 24 to 45, God's work of deliverance. Oh yes, brethren and friends, there's more, indeed there's more. And we need to squeeze as much juice out of this that we can get. And when I say juice, I'm talking about spiritual juice uh, that we can be encouraged and built up to keep keeping on. Yes, as we uh, look to close down, we want to have one more song. After this song by Brother Sean, uh, we'll have the closing prayer uh, by Brother Delva. And after the closing prayer, we head into our fellowship rooms where we get to meet and greet uh, more with one another. Brother Sean. Man, God is good. He is not the temptation. He is not the temptation, for he is Join together uh, as we go to the throne of grace, as we close in prayer. Yes, Brother Delva, can you close us in prayer kindly and then 
we go into a break with it. Brother Delvoy needs to be unmuted. Shall we pray? Thank you. Let us pray. Righteous and eternal God, we approach your throne of grace, giving you thanks for all your many wonderful blessings. We thank you so much for your plan for our lives. That we strive to be of action. We thank you, God, for being so good to us. We thank you for your unconditional love. We also thank you, God, for providing the blueprint for our lives. And we pray, that God, that we would certainly build upon that blueprint. Your word tells us that your son, Jesus Christ, has left us an example, and all we need to do is to follow in his steps. God, we thank you that you are indeed a keeper. And we pray, that God, that you continue to keep us in the hollow of your hands. We pray that God that we will never stop worshiping you. We will not never stop singing your praises. Help us that God to always strive to be children of light. Help us that God to let our light shine wherever we may go. We thank you so much for the speakers this night. We thank you for the words that were imparted. We pray your blessing upon them and we just pray that God that, that we would just take those words uh, of encouragement and we'd use it to help us to keep on keeping on. We pray for those who might be discouraged this night. We pray that God, that through what has been said, they would see the need, that God, to continue to hold to your unchanging hands. Just help us, that God, to strive to, to walk in the light as your Son, Jesus Christ, continues to, to lead the way. God, just help us to continue to, to look to you because you are indeed the fount of all blessings. And we thank you for all the blessings that you continually provide for us. And Father, help us to always remember that everything that we do, all that we have, all that we are, comes from you. You are the one, dear God, who controls everything. You are sovereign. And God, as we prepare to, to, to close this night, we pray that God for what is to happen tomorrow. We pray for even greater attendance uh, tomorrow. And we just look forward, dear God, to a, another night of spiritual songs, of uplifting singing and and wonderful messages. We thank you for what has transpired this far, and we just thank you so much for blessing and guiding us. We also ask you to be with Darian, whatever his needs may be, we pray that God that you would meet those needs, Father, because you are a God who can make all things possible. Watch over us, dear God, guide us, and we thank you so much for a wonderful evening. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Over to you, brother Peter. It's okay, but it's a bit late. We'll do that tomorrow. Thank you very much.